So let me welcome you all to this session um, on theology and digital contexts. Um, I'll be chairing the session. My name is Agana and Siri Agana. Um, and for this session, we have Rudolf von Sinner, and Anche Jacqueline, and Monsignor Lucio Adrian Ruiz. Um, Rudolf is a professor, um, is professor at a pontifical at Pontificia Universidade Catal Catolica do Parana, Brazil. Do Parana, Brazil. Did I say that right? Um, you did there, but you did very well. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for your generosity. Um, Andrzej is Archbishop Emeritus of the Church of Sweden. Um, um, and Lucio is Secretary of the Diacastery for Communication at the Vatican. I want to thank you for joining us for this panel. Um, and I'm looking forward to the conversation that we're going to have on, on digitality and contextuality. We will have 10 minutes for each of the panelists to give us a short impulse on, on, on the theme of the, of the conference, after which we'll have a general conversation in which I'll ask them a couple of um, questions. So without further ado, um, will we, can we have the first presentation from you, Rudolf? Yes, thank you so much, Agana, uh, and also to all of you in the network for the invitation, which has been extended to me by Florian Höhne, but I do know a number of others who are also here in the room. So greetings to you. It's an honor uh, to hear, be, be here between Archbishop Emeritus Jacqueline Len and Monsignor Ruiz. And I have a bit of both of them because I'm a Lutheran theologian, but I work at a Catholic university. So um, that's why I have to be here in the middle of, of the two. Uh, let me share with you um, my text so you can read it. I hope you can see it. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. So let's go ahead. <clears throat> it is no novelty that there still is a digital divide, although the availability of internet connections, private or public, and of devices to access, namely smartphones, has increased very considerably also in the global south. While there is ideological restriction and control in some countries, namely in North Korea, but also in Afghanistan, China, and Cuba, to name just a few, in most places access to, use, and production of digital content have exploded, very visibly so, for instance, in Nigeria, much more than in South Africa, where I'm currently located. Certainly in Brazil, where 84% of households have access to the internet. Its use is very frequent and people very readily post their thoughts and activities on social media, sometimes with quite weak a filter and self-control. It seems that the possibility of being seen and heard, especially of those who normally are neither seen nor heard, is enormously attractive. I appear in the cyber world, therefore I exist. Be it as a real person, be it as an artificially constructed being. Digital influencers, YouTubers, and other exponents are mushrooming. People expose themselves not only very easily to commercial explorations, to surveillance and foreign intelligence, but also to reactions. Such reactions can be so longed, the so longed for likes and positive emoticons, but also shitstorms, cancel culture, cyberbullying, and even prosecution if they publish crimes, as did in their emotional hype, many invaders of the democratic institutions at Brasilia on 8th January 2023. Although they tried to erase them later when they became aware of the proofs they had just provided against themselves, others have already saved them and sent them to the federal police. By such informal as well as professional digital search and identification methods enhance the prosecution of crimes, they also enhance the possibility of surveillance and control, ever more blurring the boundary between public and private. In any case, whatever is published is practically non-erasable, and it ends up easily in the hands of those whom people don't even know or think of as possible spectators. All this happens, obviously, in a globalized, spa globalized space with considerable differences in access to alternative channels and critical awareness. For many persons in situations of vulnerability, exposure makes them even more vulnerable. Theology is here, as I see it, in demand of promoting the protection of victims, as well as reflect afresh on authenticity, privacy, and intimacy, 
and to foster responsible use of digital means. Such demand may be different in different contexts and demand other tools and participation in public discourse. Second, so I have, I put it in a kind of thesis, uh, seven of them. So this is number two. Given this very widespread access to and use of social media and other tools, communication is much more effective than through traditional media. It is much faster and reaches many more people. In terms of content, it decomplexifies and uses an ever more simple and abridged language, creating and transmitting emotions and feelings of belonging rather than critical reflection. This makes it easy to spread fake news. Once this happens, it does need enormous effort to verify if the information is correct. And worse, it seems many people don't even care whether it's true or not, as long as it fits their perception of the world. Jair Bolsonaro, for example, example frequently quotes John aged 32, then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Where truth apparently means whatever Bolsonaro or his crew declare as such on digital platform. This reaches many Christians and is also actively promoted by them. The higher purpose in their view seems to sanctify whatever means necessary, even outright lie. Indeed, it seems lying has become a Christian in quotation marks, virtue. Many have lost any shame in this regard. And similar phenomena can be, as you well know, observed in other contexts. In this case, theology is apt to reformulate an ethical theory of shame, of truth, and of human responsibility while being sensitive to contextual resonances or dissonances, including of these very concepts. Third, this challenge undermines truth and reliability trust and accountability, and thus democracy and its underlying value systems. So that refers to the earlier thesis, not to theology, what I said at the end. Especially right-wing groups, including not too few Christian exponents and groups, invoke freedom in order to be able to circulate any content they like. Indeed, the very idea of a platform is, in theory, to mediate whatever participants want to share. In this sense, it is universal and democratic. However, given the diffusion of hate speech and other ways of, of violence, cyberspace shows not to be ethically neutral ground. Legislation tries to get hold of this and make the platforms co-responsible for the content they provide access for. In the academy, we face the challenge not only of plagiarism, but of the use of tools like ChatGPT to generate, or maybe rather assemble, content which is not technically plagiarism, as it does not simply use existing content and hide its true authorship. But while generating from assembling information this, uh, that is there in the internet, it also, blur, it also blurs authorship and undermines the Freirian, referring to Paulo Freire, impetus of helping students to become authentic and truly free subjects. Theology here is requested to bring in a, in a robust concept of freedom, of responsivity, and responsibility. Four, while access is getting easier, the providers of flat platforms and the businesses using algorithms to provide specific offers, exercising a kind of, as Byun Chul Han calls it, smart or seductive power, are not equally distributed, but located predominantly in the United States of America and a couple of other countries. While there is a democratizing move in getting access, there is and continues as it has been in neoliberal capitalism, highly monopolizing, or at least oligopolizing. Some develop a critique in this line, a critique of digital colonialism, and stress the need for digital sovereignty. One should not forget, this not only refers, this problem not only refers to data exploration and software development, but also to hardware. These gigant gigantic amounts of data have to be stored somewhere and half of such data centers are in the United States. While the main smartphone producers are Apple and Samsung, the necessary raw materials come from countries like Brazil, Bolivia, and the Democratic Republic of Congo. Again, the North needs the South, but of course not in equal terms. And all of it needs abundant energy supply, a challenge in many countries, including the one I'm hosted by at this moment. Here, theology is in demand for a robust concept of justice and decoloniality, for which contextual contributions are tantamount, 
not least as to economic, but also to epistemological justice. How do we value, also intercontextually, which type of knowledge or a variety of types of knowledge? Five, ecclesiastically, the existence of digital platforms doubtlessly was important for maintaining contact with church members, even when churches had to close and people had to stay at home during the worst moments of the COVID-19 pandemic. Most congregations used some platform to stream their worship services and other activities. They even reached more persons than they would normally do and invented some okay. new ways of relating to members and beyond. Okay. At the same time, many had difficulties in adapting to this amplification and recognized the specificity of technologically transmitted, universally and often permanently available moments of church life that would normally be unique and have a degree of spontaneity and situation comic that works in a specific group, but not when streamed to the wider public. Activities did not necessarily become more interactive, although some did use the chat and comment facilities offered by the respective platforms, at least to say they were there. Theology here has to rethink ecclesiology as to a true synodality and priesthood of all believers and the means that best serve interaction between them. Six, a specific question that occurred was how to celebrate Holy Communion mediated through technology. The real presence of Christ in communion does presuppose the real presence of community, even more so when blessed or consecrated material elements are being used. While a technolo technologically mediated celebration is not less real than an in-person one, after all, it is a televised real celebration, the partaking of bread and wine cannot be provided. Various solutions were tested, drive-through distribution, takeaway, home communion, or even just Eucharistic fasting for want of an acceptable solution. At stake were not only the technological challenge, inclusivity, and the maintenance of access for as many believers as possible, but the coherence in faith, doctrine, and church order, all elements of what theologically we would call Catholicity. It made clear that while a sermon could easily be transmitted digitally without losing content or even effect, the same was not possible with Holy Communion. The fact that many of my church's members did not seem to miss it too much says something about our way of believing in the real presence of Christ and the importance of community. And this demands theology as to a contextual and Catholic understanding of the sacraments. And seven and last thesis, a last comment on understanding God. God presents God's self as a verb rather than a noun. I am who I shall be, or other appropriate translations of Exodus 3.14. Presence and absence of God, perception and invisibility, the Deus revelatus et absconditus is, as I see it, reinforced through digitalization. And with God, also human being, created in God's image and likeness, oscillates between presence and absence, which in turn has a bearing on how we imagine God. Two aspects seem to me especially, to be especially important. Firstly, God might be absent and not subject to knowledge beyond God's self-revelation, especially in Jesus Christ. But God is faithful to God's covenant, faithful to God's promises. God might be absconditus, but God is not fake. Secondly, this God is passionate about God's creation and God's people, especially those who suffer. God is represented not by any machine or technology, but by human beings created in God's image and likeness. Rudolf, I'm Holy sorry to interrupt. Beings. I'm very sorry to interrupt. Sorry. I realize you're your last point. Yeah, this is the last point. I'm I'm just finishing. Right, yes, yes. Um, we we yeah. have. A... You see, you see the last five lines. Only human beings can exercise discernment in the full sense and respond to others for the decisions they take. Furthermore, only humans can touch with love. Wherefore, a blessing robot, as was experimented with in Wittenberg during the commemoration of the 500 years of the Reformation, is, in my view, an aberration. These specifically human qualities of love and touch should be strengthened in any context, which I believe not to the least to be a theological task. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Rudolf. Um, we'll go right on to Anje. Um, I, I tried to cure, cure it off on time in, in private chat, 
Um, I'll do the same. So apologies for those intrusions, but two minutes of time, I'll give you an audio warning, okay? If you're not done yet, please carry on. Thank you. Um, I will start with a few words about the context I come from. I was shaped by both academia and the church, with my area of research being the dialogue between science and religion. And over the years, I have witnessed how the focus of that dialogue has shifted from physics in the 1980s to biology and cognitive science, followed by climate science uh, and the world of digitalization prominently represented by AI. By the way, it is when we don't use it, we usually call it AI. When we have integrated it in our everyday life, we often anthropomorphize it and give it names. A choice of names that can be interesting also from a perspective of gender analysis. Now that's a contextuality which I'm not going to go into now. But notably, the context of AI compels us to re revisit what we mean by intelligence. It is worthwhile to recall the distinction between ratio and intellectus. And here I draw some inspiration from the 15th century scholar in philosophy, theology, law, mathematics, and astronomy, Nicholas of Cus, uh, also known as Cusa, who makes this distinction. And following him, we can describe ratio as the calculating, planning, and controlling part of the mind. Thus, ratio takes us a long way in leading our everyday lives. Intellectus is the part of the mind that is associated with insight and wisdom. It is by virtue of intellectus that we intelligibly can relate to the unknown both in terms of the not yet known and the unknowable. Hence, the knowing the unknowable precisely as unknowable is an intellectual achievement. So AI does great, indeed overwhelmingly great, when it comes to the ratio dimension of intelligent. It gets much trickier, however, when it comes to the intellectus dimension of intelligence. AI can mirror and magnify, but how does that relate to the brain's mirror neurons, the ones that are crucial for the ability to feel empathy? Not only that, in a theological context, a reflection on the role of the imperfect remains crucial. We even talk about the human factor when mistakes are made. Life would probably be deadly dull if we were all perfect, and we would definitely not have this conference. Um, in fact, it is the dynamics between perceived imperfection and the imagination of a more perfect world that drives technological development, including digitalization. Theoretically, achieved perfection would destroy development by killing the energy. But it's not really the failure itself that is most human. There's no reason to romanticize our imperfection. It causes harm to nature, other people, and ourselves. Rather, it is the willingness to take responsibility for mistakes and misdeeds that expresses our humanity. We reach our full humanity when we are sensitive to the consequences of our failures, listen and respond by taking responsibility. Our common human experience tells us that we are moral subjects. It is part of our dignity as human beings that we can admit guilt, face the consequences, come forward to apologize or forgive, atone, make amends and seek reconciliation. How this will play out in an AI world is yet to be known. However, the greater the possibilities, the greater the need to ask critical and self-critical questions. What does, does AI do to our human self-understanding? And what about the digital divides? 
who is benefiting in the short run and in the long run? Who is paying the price in the short term and in the long term? How will AI be good for the little ones, those who Jesus used to move center stage, knowing that what is good for them is often good for the big ones as well? The, the paradigm behind digital technology seems to be perfection. And its imperative is optimize, maximize. More data, the better. The paradigm behind theology is salvation. And the mandate is conversion and sanctification. Could one maybe say that the digital ideal is computation, while the human ideal is contemplation? Or in other words, does human intelligence speak in otium and artificial intellig intelligence in negotium? That is otium, leisure, negotium, non-leisure, work, busyness. What about the relationship between play and work in the digital world? Is homo ludens replaced by homo laborans? Ludens playing, not necessarily the same as gaming, because there are also gaming in the digital world, of course. Um, the, the study um, work, pray, code, uh, with the subtitle, When Work Becomes Religion in Silicon Valley, by sociologist Carolyn Chen, seems to suggest just that. In the working culture of Silicon Valley, religion and spirituality are no longer an expression of homo ludens, so to speak, but subordinated to the logic of labor. Spiritual practice becomes productivity practice aimed at increasing work output. A telling example is they have like walking a labyrinth as a practice that symbolizes sacred pilgrimage. At the center, etched in stone, is not a religious or spiritual symbol, but the company logo. <clears throat> of course, a caveat, caveat is in place here. Systematic theologians like me, we love distinctions because they reveal so much knowledge. But when it, when it comes to the digital rail realm, many of the distinctions we are used to become increasingly blurred. Nevertheless, there are questions that remain contextually relevant, like Will AI be able to feel shame, to worship, to indulge in otium, in leisure? Or is it about pure and, in the end, poor negotium? Let me conclude this by briefly referring to Nobel laureate Kasu Ishiguro's uh, 2021 novel Clara and the Sun, which I'm sure many of you have met before. Um, it holds relevance for theological contexts since it touches on the question of whether there is something uniquely human that no AI can replace. So Clara, the main, one of the main characters, is an artificial friend of a girl named Josie who is seriously ill. The idea is that Clara will learn Josie so perfectly that she can be the continuation of Josie if the biolo biological Josie dies. The researcher in the novel believes that he has scientific proof that this is possible. He tries to convince Josie's mother saying, our generation still carries the old feelings that there is something inside that is unique and cannot be transferred. But there is no such thing. We know that now. People our age find it hard to let go. But we have to let go, Chrissy. It's not faith you need, just rational thinking. That's what the scientist says. When Joseph is dead, Dad wonders, he gets some kind of the, the similar question. The idea of something uniquely human, an individual essence, 
seems more and more like inherited superstition to get rid of. The irony in the novel is that while people think they need to get rid of faith in favor of rational thinking, the artificial Clara is showing all the more religious traits as the novel proceeds. She develops religious beliefs about the power of the sun and laboriously seeks out a special place and time to say a prayer for Josie's recovery. She sacrifices something for an altruistic purpose and says she did it willingly, even though because of this sacrifice, her abilities are no longer what they once were. She says, I can't explain yet. And I was forced to sacrifice something, but it doesn't matter because now we can start hoping again. At the end of the story, Clara returns to the question of the unique personality. She says that the researcher who concluded that it didn't exist was looking in the wrong place. There was something very special, but not inside Josie, Clara says. It was inside those who loved her, Clara's words. According to Clara, it's relationships, relationality that make up the uniquely human. So why people disfaith Clara, the artificial friend, starts to reason like a theologian. Conclusion, digital contexts require theology to be understood and to understand themselves. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Lucio, over to you. 10 minutes, I will, I'll give you warnings by text, but two minutes of time. If you're not done, I will signal you here. Take thank you. A pleasure to be with you all. And um, thank you for this invitation. The title, um, the idea for my presentation is the digital environment from instrument to culture, a missionary outlook. The third point is the incarnation of the word is the metaphysics of communication. Many times and in many ways, God spoke in the past to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last times, he has spoken to us by his son. The foundation of all communication is Christ, the communicative event of God. Thus, the incarnation of the word is the archetype of the inculturation of the gospel, the mystery of incarnation, because the word becoming man does not assure, assume a theoretical flesh, but a real one with a language and a concrete culture. This is the task of the church to make the incarnation of the word permanent in every moment and every culture to make visible and comprehensible the EFA packs always present and operative in history until the end of time. Cultures change and are transformed and therefore the gospel must enter into them to redeem them because was what is not assumed is not redeemed and make it present. The word assume human nature to redeem it. Therefore, the gospel must be incarnated in the culture to transform it, to make God present and to bring it to him. Thus, the incarnation is the event, the law, and the criterion of the gospel proclamation. The hologos sars egeneto become the proper and essential reality of evangelization. This demands that the church, in every time and in every culture, may the word present in such a way 
that he live among us and that the culture make epiphany of his presence, allowing those who seek him to find him. Well, the digital culture is a space for evangelization. Given the reality that God is incarnate and continue to make himself present, communicating himself to people of every generation, we must ask ourselves how the communication of the gospel in our time, which is that of a digital culture, can be transforming communication capable to bring in the salvation. This become particularly important when Pentecost present us with two important key elements. The first, the opening of the synagogue when the apostles open the doors and go out to preach, overcoming the fear and ke that kept them locking up. But the second element that stand out in the text is that those who hear them understood them in their own native languages. The kerygma was not only preached, but the action of the Holy Spirit make it understood in the language of the listeners. Unfortunately, this is not understood always by us. For that is an element that does not transform our mission in this world. If we observe the evangelizing action, we see that with great difficulty, the church assumed the contemporary culture penetrating it and making the language of the culture, redeem it, the language of the new evangelization. Therefore, we could ask ourselves why the church has not yet finished recognizing and assuming the digital culture as a space of evangelization and mission to seek and to meet the contemporary man and woman. I think that one of the factors is that it has not yet overcome the instrumental vision of the digital. We can verify this permanently because the mentality is still that of using the digital. Digital tools are seen as utilitarian and serve only as such. But the most frequent is the negative judgment, critical, permeated by the fear of treats of or superficiality, considering the digital as a leisure species, associating it only to recreational or gaming activities or considering it as a space for wasting time. Its language is also seen as frivolous, light, incapable to, of generating a valid communication to find the person and transmit the message. For this reason, its value is a first proclamation, and this value is underestimated. Or worse, its value as a means of reaching out especially to the existential peripheries where we find so many 30 brothers and sisters full of questions where the suffering flesh of Christ can be touched. There is a language, a dynamic, and a way proper to today's culture that we are called to assume in order to reach the man and woman of today. 
for a missionary language is the door to communicate. And if we are not assuming the language of the new culture, it will be difficult for the message of the gospel to reach the mind and heart of the today man and woman. So enculturation processes are necessary to establish an effective dialogue with each culture and thus be able to identify the needs of each environment. And in our case, we must take into account that digital reality and communicative reality in general are not a simple instrument, but a culture, our culture, because the instruments are only used. The culture is, the, is evangelized, missioned, and the church is inculturated. Finally, I want to share with you an experience which for two years and a half, I have been accompanying a project called The Church is Listening to You. It is about putting into practice the thought that I have shared with you. With 2,000 young influencers and digital missionaries, we have gone out to the networks to seek the suffering flesh of Christ so that the message reach to the existential end of the earth to reach everyone. And no one is left without knowing the tenderness and mercy of Jesus. Together, as a family, in so many languages, from so many cultures, with so many vision and missions, feeling in our heart the missionary sending of the Lord, we wanted to be present there for a first proclamation, to answer that question, to accompany those who seek to bring the message, speaking their languages in their times, and with our love. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lucio. Thank you very much indeed. Um, let me take a minute and thank you all for those very, very insightful um, prompts. Um, first, first, you, Rudolf, for pointing us to how we value um, knowledge contextually from a political public theology perspective, um, as, I, as I heard your talk. Anje, um, for pointing us to the blurring of distinctions between the human and the machine, um, from a very, very insightful um, perspective. Um, and, and Lucio, your, your points about the sacred and the profane um, and how they, they can inform mythological approaches that transcend um, utilitarianism um, and lead us towards a language and epistemology of, of flourishing. I think those are very, very insightful takes on how context raises problems and then gives us opportunity to conceptualize the human experience and improve it. So thank you very much. Um, I, want to, I want to ask you a few questions and we'll just take it in the same order as you have given your presentations, if that's fine, but um, feel free to mix it up. Um, first thing I'm wondering about is just fundamentally, how do we even define digital contexts? What do we mean? by a digital context, what, how do you understand it? So if you say we follow the order, but please don't stick to that. Colleagues come in also before me, but I can make a start. Um, as I understand it, the, the, there's many people involved in the whole process of what happens in the digital world. So although it's somehow a world of its own with its own dynamics, but there are concrete people who put content there, who put technology, who develop that technology, who are consuming it or interacting with others. And we have to see, so in what context are the people who participate from different uh, areas and with different interests, be it as single user, be it as influencers, be it as uh, businesses who want to know uh, all that data that so many people voluntarily give up from themselves to be to be public, yeah. Um, so and and use it then for for economic uh, purposes or even for political or other purposes, as we've also seen in these past years. Um, so there's a number of interests involved and a number of uh, specific uh, presuppositions of how people 
are enabled uh, and, and secure or insecure how they how to participate in these um, in, in this digital world. I, I now use it as a, as a big thing. You know, we have so many aspects and some of them have come out uh, through our teachers. So, uh, so I would, in the first place, if you speak about context, look about the people involved with the specific interests and location. Thanks for that. Any, any other take on this question? Uh, yeah, I'm not sure how to define it, actually. And maybe in our time, it is easier to define non-digital contexts because we do not always notice the digital when it works uh, we rather notice it when it malfunctions to the point of breaking down um not necessarily necessarily when it malfunctions uh, in the sense of lack of wholesomeness mm. uh, but when it's absent altogether we definitely notice so so i'm wondering what sense it really makes to put a lot of effort in defining digital context in a world soon dominated by digital natives mm. That's an interesting thought. That's an interesting thought. Um, when I worked in software, it was often it was often preached that the goal of good software was to vanish, um, such that the user is not even aware um, of of it. You know, as an interface. So it's it seems like almost if we if we reach a point where software reaches perfection, the context lines collapse. You know, and it's just life, in a sense. What I I hear you saying, which is an interesting thought. Um, Lucio, any thoughts on this? Well, I think that the uh, they are existential spaces that are marked mm. by digital realities in their times, their dynamics, their logic, languages, and narrative. These uh, existential spaces configure mm, cultural spaces that also have their own expressions and that to communicate with them require learning, learning and adaptation. Mm -hmm. The keys to this reality cannot be reduced to simple technological phenomena or activities, no? devoid of an anthropological value. Indeed, indeed. Sometimes when I think about, about this question, I ask myself whether, you know, if we talk about digital learning context, is it a question of addition or a kind of multiplication? You know, is it is it a, a whole bigger than the sum of the parts situation that we, we are talking about? I think that's what you're hinting at. And thanks for those reflections. But I am still going to force the question a little bit and ask you how, if in any way at all, the concept of digital context influences your own work in theology or mission or pastoring? Or research as, you know, theological yeah. academics as well. Who wants to go first? Yeah. Well, if, if we understand that incarnation, in my thought, you know, is the even, as I said before, the law and criterion of evangelization, I think that demands that the proclamation is always incarnated in the culture where it is announced. You know? It is not possible to do well theology without knowing and wanting to reach the listeners. That is extremely important. Want to How are reach you? The listener. Are you it's doing? Yes, good and you. Very good. Thank you very much. Do we have um Please mute your microphone if you are a legitimate member of this conversation. Otherwise, we might need to check who we have a bomber. Please carry on. Right. Sorry about that. Lucio, how, how did you finish your point? Yeah, yeah. I said no, that it's really important for me the, the, that we must want to reach a listener. It's extremely important. It is intrinsic to the proclamation to be understood so that the culture must model the form of the transmission. Fantastic, thanks. Um, Andrzej Rudolph, does it come up at all in your work? Uh, well, what, what definitely influences my, my way of thinking of theology and doing theology is 
just the insight that um, never before has such a small group of designers, mostly pretty young white guys in Silicon Valley, had the power to influence how billions of us think, act, and live our lives. Uh, te with technology changing what we do, how we think, uh, and how we view ourselves and constantly tracking the changes. I mean, Susanna Shuboff talking about a, um, a trade in human futures, our attention as a gold mine, our minds to be mined, our changes of behavior, even if they are so slight that we don't even notice them ourselves, uh, being a merchandise to be capitalized on. Of course, that needs to influence my theology. Uh, the second thing is uh, the biases in algorithms uh, producing discrimination and all of that uh, mm. is definitely influencing how we can think about anthropology. Um, and uh, uh, well, third point is also about anthropology. Um, if a, oh, well, the question, can a chatbot experience death anxiety? We would say no, at this point in time, probably. Uh, but if a chatbot speaks more intelligently about its fake fear of death than my human friend about their perceived fear of death, how, how do we evaluate that? I think that also uh, will impact on how I can do theology. Indeed, indeed. Um, okay, wait, there's, okay, yes, go for it. Yes, uh, well, just continuing um, some of this thought, I think there are two, two aspects that for me are very crucial in this. One is that, um, the, the, as, as Jante Bell said, there is a group, a small group that produces all, all these technology, you know, and then it's used, it's, it's, uh, in, in function everywhere, but the way people use it and access it and work with it is very different. Depends on, on, on their uh, stage of education, it depends on their access to alternative information, it depends on their meta-knowledge on what's happening. Uh, and if all that is not easily uh, available and maybe the emotional feeling of, I, ca I can't be there, I'm now finally somewhere in the world, no? which many people feel which are normally excluded from, from uh, so much that is going on, uh, this, fasc this fascinium can be very easily explored and is explored, and people make money with it. No? So, um, so that is, for me, a very different context, which also comes into issues, or in issues of justice, and on the other hand, on authenticity. So how uh, do people themselves present in such a group and how do they know the other one is a person at all it can be a chatbot who simulates very well like the death fear no uh, anti just said or other other elements uh, but i don't know is it a real person is it not a real person is this real life is it not real life um and this uh, for me poses a lot of question both on on the human being as such and the specific way uh, located human beings can actually although they participate in a worldwide uh, venture, but how can they actually concretely deal with it and uh, and 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 um, uh, be protect themselves and also be protected from uh, 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 as what some call digital colonialism? Fantastic, um, fantastic. Thanks, thanks for the submissions, all of you. And and it does tie into my next question because I want us now to reflect, and perhaps this is the the one we have um, the last one we we'll have time for. So you've all raised different ways in which the digital poses challenges to doing theology, right? Public political theology, mission, theological anthropology. Um, are these, how, how, how similar and how different are these challenges in different contexts, you know, parts of the world, cultures? Um, do you, do, when you look at our interaction with the digital, um, are these challenges um, universal? Are they localized? Are, are there peculiarities in the ways in which we are challenged? Um, and are there similarities that you know are equally compelling? How how have you perceived this as a global discourse?
Well, I can go first. <laughs> uh, then you can prove, yes, you should. prove all that. Um, uh, I think it's a huge question and uh, in a sense an impossible question since nobody has this um, overall view. But I would still say that, um, um, I mean, huge parts of the world are, are uh, for now troubled by uh, what I tend to call the dangerous cocktail of the five poisonous peas with um, populism, polarization, protectionism, post-truth and patriarchy. And in all these, uh, all these P's, uh, actually digitalization has the potential of providing means to overcome the disastrous synergy of that toxic cocktail. Uh, I mean, it can provide connectivity, it can provide education and knowledge in unprecedented ways. Uh, that's the good news. The bad news is we don't see it happen as it should be happening. Uh, in fact, we often see that it uh, even strengthens polarization or deepens polarization. Uh, it increases the gender divide. Um, last year at the UN uh, uh, Commission on the Status of Women, it was um, said that women and girls have 20% less access to digital tools and the tools they have access to are less advanced than the tools uh, boys and men have access to. Uh, at the same time, they run 27% more risk of being harmed online. Um, and as long as so few uh, women are part of this whole development, this is not going to change anytime soon. Um, so, and, and also the labor market, of course, um, and that looks differently in different contexts, but I mean, this, this change from when we used to say more people means growth to saying more data means growth, that ch shift is momentous and we haven't seen the full range of it yet. Um, but that are some of the factors that I think are sort of global, even if the consequences locally can, can differ. Yes, indeed. Any other takes on this? If not, I'll just throw into the mix as you contemplate and feel free to answer this or, or, or the stunning question. Whether digitality takes anything away from your theologizing as well. We tend to talk a lot about what it adds. Is there anything it takes away at all? Um, and we have two minutes before we wrap up. Can I still answer for the for the latter, for the last question, if if you don't mind? Um, it, 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 th theoretically, the the digital world is highly democratic. You know? it, 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 it enables people to participate, to create, to interact, to to be on their, their on their own account. However, um, that is that becomes ever more blurred in two aspects. One is that still content provided by some others is has a homogenizing tendency. And, and it has a specific model of, of men and women and of people. Even There's even some who speak about a digital racism in terms of you know, the specific model that is portrayed uh, of, of a human being in, in, in the web and in the games and in the, in the programs and on. So there's an epistemological problem. But there's also one that now uh, the, there is uh, ever more an own dynamic that the tools develop and they are trained to do so. Um, and now, how, where does, does that lead us? It's interesting, theologically, um, that uh, some use, as this is a collaboration between those who work on it and, those, and, and the system itself, what it develops, it called that transubstantiation, <laughs> a theological term uh, we have from Eucharistic theology. So, so there is theology even, in, in, uh, in, at least in concepts and terms, uh, in, in what is happening there. But it does challenge our, our, the way we perceive reality. And, uh, and I think that is a, a constant challenge for theology um, uh, we have to, to ever, ever better grapple with. And we, don't, we are not there, there, there. Maybe we never, because development is so enormously quick. Because we cannot just abandon uh, the task in, in, uh, uh, for this. We have to... Uh, to get means to also discuss this with others around the world. Yes. Fantastic, fantastic. Thank you all very much. Uh, 